Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. Shall we make some more movement, inshaAllah? Keep filling the gaps, sit as close as possible. Jazakumullah khaira. Let's keep moving in. Sit as close as possible. Jazakumullah khaira. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما رسدروا شريف اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أكان هي يو اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. All I can say is ما شاء الله. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. May Allah be pleased with you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you more and more barakah. The fact that you are here and you're conducting these majalis and that you're showing up in these kind of numbers, it's a sign that alhamdulillah, you are winning. You are on the right side. You are on the haq. You are still firm on your deen. And these are great things to have to show that alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing the ummah. We are all together. We are united. Masajid are working together. Muslims are working together. Muslims, alhamdulillah, have united in a way that they haven't since, ev- since forever. We've not known Muslims to get together on any topic like people are coming together on the topic, on the discussion, on the cause of Masjid al-Aqsa, Bayt al-Maqdis and Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us. I'm sharing this so that you know that alhamdulillah what you're doing is working it's making a difference they don't want us to speak about these things they don't want us to gather in these ways they want us to remain silent they want to cancel us out but the fact that you're still turning up you're continuing and as Qari Sab just said that this is not a one-off gathering inshallah you're going to continue this alhamdulillah inshallah we're going to continue this whenever the masjid or Qari Sab or from Habibul Quran or any majlis any masajid organize anything inshallah we will continue for this cause even long after things have settled down. Even long after things have settled down. And this is what we're going to speak about today, inshallah. So before we get into discussing what we are going to discuss, I wanted to share something. And that is, whatever is happening in Gaza right now, the struggle that the people of Gaza are experiencing, the primary reason, the primary reason and the cause and the core of the issue are the violations that happen in Masjid Al-Aqsa. I'll repeat that again. You might have not heard this, but this is the primary cause of the struggle of Gaza today and all over generally in Palestine is because of the violations that are taking place in Masjid Al-Aqsa. For your information, almost on a daily basis, every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not Juma because it's the holy day for the Muslims, not Saturday because it's the Sabbath, the holy day for them. But other than that, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, twice a day, twice a day, there are extreme right-wing Zionist settlers carry out incursions into Masjid Al-Aqsa twice a day. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, some years ago when we had COVID and you all saw the pictures of Baytullah, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and there was nobody there. Have you all seen that picture? You've all seen that image. Yeah. And every many of you have still got it on your profile. That image which will resonate in our minds forever. We'll never forget this. How did you feel when you saw this? How did you feel? Sad? What else? Did it do something inside you? Maybe you're not able to express it. But did it, 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 you felt something, didn't you? You're a muahid, you're a Muslim, you're a mu'min. You love the Kaaba, you love Masjid al-Haram. And when you saw it in this pitiful state, it did something to you. If we see Masjid al-Nabwi, may Allah never make that happen. If we saw Masjid al-Nabawi in that state, we will feel pain. We will feel hurt. It would do something in our inside. But Masjid al-Aqsa goes through this on a daily basis. Everything that happens in a synagogue happens in Masjid al-Aqsa on a daily basis. Talmudic rituals are carried out, which is against a, it's a violation of number one international law. And it's a violation of Jewish law. It's not allowed. 
Masjid al-Aqsa in its entirety is only a place of worship for Muslims alone. This is recognized as international law and the status quo of Jerusalem. Despite that, let me tell you something very fresh. Just from two days ago, two days ago, there was a person, a Zionist settler, who carried out an incursion into Masjid al-Aqsa, wearing a t-shirt, very provocative. On the back of the t-shirt, it said it had a map of Palestine and also the occupied Golan Heights. And the whole map of Palestine is covered in the occupier's flag, the Israeli flag. And the caption written below it was, Our enemy know that whoever dominates this masjid, they've called it Temple Mount, we call it Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, dominates the whole region. So even they know why. They know exactly why. So I go back to the beginning. The primary reason and the primary cause for what is happening in Gaza is due to the ongoing violations in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And the difficult conditions that the people of Jerusalem are living in and the displacement policies are there. We don't have time to go into that now. Now, let me ask you a question. Before we go into any of this, mashallah, the recitation was beautiful. And in the recitation, we heard Surah Al-Isra. In Surah Al-Isra, we hear, Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Al-masjid al-aqsa. Whose term is this? Whose term is this? This is Allah's term. One of Allah's special words. He named the masjid Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now, because the Quran calls it Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, am I allowed, me, can I or you, or for anybody's sake, is anybody allowed to interpret Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa how they want? When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the Quran, the first question we need to ask, when Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, what does Allah mean? When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, what does Allah mean? Tell me, what does Allah mean? When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, what is He referring to? Because if this is the core of the issue, and we don't know what we're talking about, then how are we going to move forward from here? So this is, a, this is the first thing people of the mihrab, people of the mimbar, people of the masjid, which are all of you are, our beginning on this journey must be from here, from the Quran. Not 1967, not 1948. These are very valuable, important pieces of historic information. We must know this, we must learn this. But this should not be our first introduction to the story and to the cause and to the message of Masjid Al-Aqsa. It must be grounded in the Quran and the Sunnah. Our understanding of Masjid Al-Aqsa, of Palestine, of Bayt Al-Maqdis must be grounded in the Quran and Sunnah. So I ask you again, I'm asking you a question by the way. When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the Quran, what does Allah mean? Not what YouTube says. Our knowledge in regards to Masjid Al-Aqsa comes from YouTube. Many years ago, in the 80s, the older people will agree with me here, they would say that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is the, 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 the one with the golden dome. Then, mashallah, we became enlightened with social media, YouTube, and people started saying, no, 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 it's not that one. It's the other one. It's the one with the gray dome or the black dome or the green dome. When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the Quran, let me tell you what he doesn't mean. Allah is not referring to a building. He does not mean a building. And to understand Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, we have to understand Al-Masjid Al-Haram, which comes before this in the ayah. Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-Masjid Al-Haram ila al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Masjid Al-Haram. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses of the Quran, what was Al-Masjid Al-Haram? Who can tell me? What is Al-Masjid Al-Haram? Hmm? You've been listening to the talks. Yep. The Kaaba. So Kaaba is a very specific term. Allah calls the Kaaba the Kaaba in the Quran. The Kaaba is a very specific term. When Allah says Al Masjid Al Haram, it didn't just refer to the Kaaba because Allah says in the Quran, face towards Al Masjid Al Haram. When you're inside Al Masjid Al Haram, you face towards the Kaaba. When you're outside, you're facing towards Al Mafawalli Wajha Ka Shatr Al Masjid Al Haram. What does it mean? The Kaaba was in the center. The Kaaba was in the center. And around the Kaaba, there was open area until where the houses started. This whole area, the open area, including the Kaaba, all of this is Al-Masjid Al-Haram. 
which tells us that Al Masjid Al Haram, most of Masjid Al Haram was an open area. There was, the building was only in the middle, the Kaaba. Most of Masjid Al Haram was open area, open space. You could see the sky. Exactly in the same way, most of Masjid Al Aqsa is open area, open spaces. Majority of Masjid Al Aqsa is open space. The buildings, yes, there are buildings there. Scholars of the past have tried to explain Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Sheikh Al Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah gave a very simplistic ex- explanation. He says, everything within the outer wall. Everything within the outer wall. So, how much space is that? So, this is a lesson you're going back with. 144,000 square meters. How many? 144,000 square meters of land. Everything on it. Everything beneath it, everything surrounding it, every centimeter belongs to the Muslims. There is no compromise, there is no partnership, there is no sharing. Even one speck of dust in Masjid Al Aqsa belongs to you. Why? Because you are a Muslim. All of the masajid and Masjid Al Aqsa is one of the greatest masjids of Allah. So, are we, are, we, are we clear on this? One of the core reasons why these Zionist incursions happen. Now, what happens when these incursions happen daily? From 7.30 a.m. till 11.30 every day. And from 1.30 to 2.30, twice a day, you have right-wing extreme Zionist settlers going inside Masjid Al-Aqsa from Babul Magharibah. Now, during this period, Palestinians are not allowed inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. Palestinians are humiliated and they are dragged out of the masjid. Anyone found in the masjid during that period, they are imprisoned. They apply fines upon them. They ban them from Masjid Al-Aqsa for two weeks, three months, sometimes even six months. Now the people who are supposed to be in Masjid Al-Aqsa are the guards of Masjid Al-Aqsa appointed by the Awqaf, which is based in Jordan. They are the custodians of Masjid Al-Aqsa. In recent years we find whilst the guards of Masjid Al-Aqsa are trying to do their job in protecting the masjid, ensuring no non-Islamic worship takes place inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. They have been shot in their eyes. In 2021, we know more than 15 guards of Masjid Al-Aqsa lost their eyesight. Why? Because they were doing their job. They were following around these incursions, ensuring the status quo, which is internationally recognized, is upheld. However, they don't want anything, any of this to happen. So what happens now inside Masjid Al-Aqsa? The shofar horn is being blown. Inside Masjid Al-Aqsa, marriage ceremonies, according to Talmudic ways, are taking place. Inside Masjid Al-Aqsa, they're carrying out bar mitzvahs. Inside Masjid Al-Aqsa, you will find everything that happens in a synagogue is happening inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why have we got to this situation? Number one is because we have misinterpreted the ayah of the Qur'an. And this is having consequences. When we have given our own meaning, when Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, nobody has a right to change its meaning and to say it's only a building. And what's happening is even many, mashallah, learned people, activists, tour guides are going there. They'll point to the Dome of the Rock and say, that's the Dome of the Rock. And they'll point to Musalla Qibli and say, this is Masjid Al-Aqsa. This is a misinterpretation of the ayah of the Quran. Al-Musalla Al-Qibli which is the place where the imam leads the salah from. Those of you who've been will know. And if you've not been, you've seen the pictures. This only constitutes 3.1% of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now what happens is when these incursions take place, people say, Muslims say, it's okay. They're not going into the masjid anyway. They're not going into the masjid anyway. So this is how very boldly these incursions have increased. And the largest numbers were, 1st of October till the 5th of October. More than 5,000 extremist right-wing Zionist settlers carried out incursions into Masjid Al-Aqsa whilst Muslims were persecuted, Muslims were banned, Muslims were not allowed to be inside Masjid Al-Aqsa at that time. Let me tell you something. At that time, at 7.30 a.m., if you are inside Masjid Al-Aqsa and you are making sajda, I guarantee you, Allah, you will be the only Muslim in the whole world making sajda in that masjid. You will be there representing the whole ummah. This is a sad and pitiful state because there'll be nobody in there whatsoever. Nobody. Because they make a concentrated effort to take everybody out. And more so, they prevent people from entering during the time of Fajr and Dhuhr. Palestinians I'm talking about. 
just so that they can facilitate these kind of incursions. May Allah give us the understanding. Now, because of this, one of the things that have happened, what even we are uh, guilty of doing, is many people travel there. It's something you would never do in your local masjid. You would never do this. Never. Never ever would you do this. Would you dare do this? Would you imagine doing this in your local masjid, in Medina Masjid? And that is, would you allow your sisters who are experiencing their monthly cycle to come inside the masjid? So why is it that we are doing it when we go to one of the holiest masjids? Because of this misinterpretation of the ayah of the Quran. Many people are going there and think, oh, Masjid Al-Aqsa is only a building. So it's okay, you can go to all of the other areas. No, no, no. Masjid Al-Aqsa is not a building. The building that you're pointing at when this ayah of the Quran was revealed, that building didn't even exist. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is 144,000 square meters of land and everything on it, above it, beneath it. You know, some months ago, somebody raised this issue and they connected it with, uh, they said, no, you know, we heard something from our Ustad, that Mufti Shabir Sahib, so just speak to him. I knew that Mufti Shabir Sahib would not have said anything like this. So speak to him directly. I said, okay, I will do that. Then I thought I can speak to my classmate, Mufti Yusuf. And before I even called him, I thought maybe on his Islamic portal, there must be something which he has already written about. This is, this is a very common issue. So I went online, went on Islamic portal, and mashallah, there's a very detailed, good explanation on Islamic portal. And what I found fascinating, normally on the fatawa that are there, you have the signature and the endorsement from Hazrat Mufti Shabir Sahib, who's one of our teachers, and also Hazrat Sufi Tahir Sahib, who's one of our teachers. On that particular one, you've got a third endorsement as well, Hazrat Mufti Taqi Osmani, Da'an Barakatum as well. So this is not just me saying this, and you can read about it for those who are more interested to find out on the fatwa that is there on Islamic portal. So this is something that if you don't take anything away today and you only take this message, I think it's very powerful. Because if we don't know what Masjid Al-Aqsa is, that's worrying. That's worrying. So is everybody clear on this, inshallah? We all know and understand now. When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the Quran, He's not referring to a building. 144,000 square meters of land, everything on it, above it, beneath it, all of it is Masjid Al-Aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding. There was a time when the world was enveloped in darkness. And we call this the Jahiliyyah, the days of ignorance, where people carried out the tawaf of the Kaaba naked. We know that they buried their daughters alive. You know the stories. You know, people would go out hunting. They would take with them four stones. Three of them they would use as a stove to cook their meal. The fourth one they would turn into an idol. They would worship it. Once they've eaten, they would throw that away. So they've thrown their God away. Sometimes they would travel and they would make bread. They wouldn't find anything else. So one piece of bread they would eat. The other one they would make into an idol and worship it. And once they become hungry, they would eat that as well. They found a piece of wood. They would make that into their God. This was the situation of the world, the pagan Arabs in particular. The world was filled with darkness until a time came, the most radiant time. And we call this the blessed Mawlid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, you must have had Sira programs in your masjid as well. As globally, we saw people celebrating and people rejoicing and commemorating the blessed birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their own ways. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was born, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us something very interesting. Before I go into this, let me ask you another question. What is the connection of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Masjid al-Aqsa? Miraj. Miraj. Okay? Miraj. This is when you ask Muslims this question, normally this is the first answer, the middle answer, and the last answer. Isa and Miraj. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's connection to Masjid al-Aqsa started with Isra, ended with Miraj. Sadaqallahu al azim let's go home. Today, inshallah, we're going to explore this because your connection to this masjid must be faith-based, not just on facts, not just on dates, not just on political events that took place. That's there. That comes and goes. And this is why we are like the BBC. When the BBC reports something, we all come together. When the BBC go quiet, we go quiet. I ask, if it wasn't for the illegal occupation of Palestine, would we even ever talk about Masjid Al-Aqsa? Honestly, would we even discuss it? 
why is this? Why is this the case? Because we don't have a faith-based understanding of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Our understanding of Masjid Al-Aqsa is not grounded in the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is what's required. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes his birth. He says, when I was born, Imam Ahmad mentioned this in his Musnad, he says, وَرَأَتْ أُمِّي نُورًا أَضَاءَتْ مِنْهَا قُصُورَ الشَّامِ He says, when I was born, a light shone from my mother. And it illuminated the palaces of the Levant, of the Sham area, Baytul Maqdis and its surrounding areas. This is the Prophet Wasallam's birth. And then we find that the Prophet Wasallam, the ulama mention, that this will be an indication of the completion of the mission of the Prophet Wasallam. When the nur of Nubuwa reaches those areas, then we find the second birth. The second birth is Nubuwa. How old was he when he became a Prophet? 40, we all know this. So this is the ulama mentioned, this is a second birth, the birth into Nubuwa. When the Prophet ﷺ is in the cave of Hira, now you might be thinking, Isra, Miraj, Isra, well you've gone all the way back. Yes, because our connection goes all the way back there. When he was in the cave of Hira, he received the first ayat of the Quran. What were they? اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ and then he comes back. Then we have a period we call Fataratul Wahi, where Wahi stopped. However long it stopped for. And then the Wahi started to come. What were the next verses? What were the following verses? Yes. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil. And which other verses? Ya ayyuhal muddathir. So let's look at what Allah is saying. This is very, very early on. No Isra and Mi'raj. We are still in Makkah al-Mukarramah. He's only received Nubuwa. And Allah is saying, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, Qumil illa qalila. Or the one who is covered in the blanket, who covers himself. Qumil in the blanket, who covers himself. Qumil layla illa, stand and pray. What is this instruction for? Salah. Salah. Again, a clarification of a misunderstanding. Salah didn't become obligatory in Isra and Mi'raj. Five times Salah became obligatory in Isra and Mi'raj. There was Salah before Isra and Mi'raj. Ummul Mu'mineen, mother of the believers, Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that the Muslims in Makkah al-Mukarramah would pray twice a day. Two rakat during the day, in the morning, and two rakat in the evening. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been given an instruction to pray. Now I ask you, what direction is he praying in? He's in Makkah al-Mukarramah. What direction is he praying in? So can we see the connection of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Masjid al-Aqsa didn't start in Isra wal Miraj. It started from the time he was born. وَرَأَتْ أُمِّي نُورًا أَضَاءَتْ مِنْهَا قُصُورَ الشَّامِ And now the first, one of the first wahi that comes down is telling him to pray. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is now praying and he's praying in the direction of Baytul Maqdis Masjid al-Aqsa. In Darul Arqam, they're praying towards Masjid al-Aqsa. When he prays by Safa, he's praying towards Masjid al-Aqsa. When he's making Hijrah and he's in the cave of Thor, they're going to pray Salah. Which direction did they pray in? Towards Masjid al-Aqsa. There's actually a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad where normally there is confusion. We generally quote the hadith of Sahih Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is shown to have prayed towards Masjid al-Aqsa for 16 or 17 months after he migrated. But the hadith says, بَعْدَ أَنْ هَاجَرَ وَبَعْدَ أَنْ هَاجَرَ سِتَّةَ عَشَرَ أَوْ سَبَعَةَ عَشَرَ شَهْرَ But the hadith of Mustad Ahmad gives the full picture. It says regarding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُصَلِّي وَهُوَ بِمَكَّةِ نَحْوَ بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ وَالْكَعْبَةُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst he was in Makkah al-Mukarramah, he would pray towards Baytul Maqdis and the Kaaba would be in front of him as well. Question for you guys. How is it possible? You be all, who's been for Umrah or Hajj? Raise your hands, let me see. Okay, mashallah, most of you. May Allah keep taking us again and again. So when you're by the Kaaba, where would you need to stand in order to face the Kaaba and Masjid al-Aqsa at the same time? Which side would you need to stand on? Because the hadith is telling us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst he was in Makkah, and it was possible, he didn't always do this because it wasn't always possible. But when it was possible, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yusalli wa huwa bi Makkah, nahwa bayt al maqdis wal ka'ba tu bayna yaday. The Kaaba would be in front of him. So where would he stand? Hmm? Very good, mashallah. Who answered that? MashaAllah. Well done. 
ركن اليماني ما شاء الله مولانا غلام صاحب بركه ركن اليماني ركن اليماني if you stand where the ركن اليماني is this is if you want to go to مكة and stand where the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم prayed for 13 years in مكة المكرمة you go and stand in this area and pray because he صلى الله عليه وسلم according to this hadith he would stand in the way whenever it was possible not always whenever it was possible there's another narration as well. Some people say, oh, did he face Baytul Maqdis? Well, there's a hadith in regards to a sahabi by the name of Bara ibn Ma'roor, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He was a leader of the people in Medina. And when they come, came to accept Islam, on the way, they hadn't seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yet. They'd accepted Islam. Whilst they're on their way to Makkatul Mukarramah to perform the hajj, he said to his companions, Ka'b ibn Malik r- relates the n- 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 narration. He says, do you know what? I'm not very comfortable facing my back towards the Kaaba. You know, we have the honor of the Kaaba. So he says, well, we've heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Kaaba is Baytul Maqdis. We have to face towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. That is our Kaaba. He says, well, you guys can face the Ka'ba, uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa. I'm going to face the Kaaba. Sahaba on that journey to Mecca from Medina Munawwara, they would stand and pray towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. Sayyiduna Bara ibn Ma'roor radiallahu anhu would face the opposite direction towards the Kaaba. They would taunt him and say, what are you doing? This is wrong. He says, no, I'm going to stay firm on this. Until they came to Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. Ka'ab ibn Malik said to him, you know what? You need to discuss it with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not very comfortable with what you've done. And they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He explained to himself. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, لَقَدْ كُنْتَ عَلَىٰ قِبْلَةٍ لَوْ صَبَرْتَ عَلَيْهَا You're already on the correct qibla, meaning Baytul Maqdis. Just be patient. There was a time when the Kaaba was about, the Qibla was about to change towards the Kaaba. But for that period and even now, and then following from this period onwards, he changed and he faced towards Masjid Al-Aqsa like all of the other Sahaba were doing at that time. Now, what's interesting is, how long was Nubuwa? We just said that at the age of 40, we started from the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then we came to the age of 40. At the age of 40, he received prophethood. When did he pass away? 63. How long is that? 23 years. Out of the 23 years, 23 years, how many years did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahaba face towards Masjid Al-Aqsa in Salah? How many years in Mecca? 13 years. It's a very long time. And then in Medina Munawwara, 16 or 17 months according to the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. Calculate it. 14. Just, just comprehend this. From 23 years, 14 and a half years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahaba faced Masjid Al-Aqsa in their Salah. And then 8 years towards the Kaaba. C- can, you, can you comprehend this? Like imagine the value, the love, the connection, the focus they had towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. And it's evident if you look at the seerah, if you read the Quran, you will be able to see it. So this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first thing is, how long they faced. So a very strong spiritual connection was made between the Sahaba and Masjid Al-Aqsa. For how many years? 14 and a half years. That's the first thing. Now, what else started to happen in Makkah Al-Mukarramah is we know Quran was being revealed. Now the ulama mentioned, أَكْثَرُ الْأَرْضِ ذِكْرًا فِي الْقُرْآنِ Which is the most mentioned land in the Quran. Without a doubt, it's the land of Baytul Maqdis, Palestine. Palestine in the Quran. We are, mashallah, people of Quran. But maybe we've not looked at Quran in this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this land. It is so beloved to him that he has mentioned everything in regards to this land in the Quran. Small, small things, big things and small things. We find the surahs about the prophets, we find the miracles, but even the smallest, minutest detail you can find regarding Palestine, Baytul Maqdis, to make you understand why you as a Muslim should be connected to this land, why you should be in the struggle for this land, not just because the BBC tells you, because the Quran tells you. And when they tell you stop talking about Palestine, that means they're trying to say to you, don't talk about the Quran, because the Quran is filled with this. Let me give you a few examples just to understand. How much Allah loves Masjid Al-Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis, Palestine, all you have to do is open the Quran. Allah speaks about even the most minute things. For example, Allah speaks about the wind of Baytul Maqdis. Wali Sulaiman al-Riha. Guduha Shahrun Warawahuha Shahr. 
Allah speaks about the mountains of Baytul Maqdis. Ya jibalu awwi bi ma'ah. Allah speaks about the branches of Baytul Maqdis. Wa huzzi ilayki bi jiz'in nakhla. And then Allah speaks about the dates of Baytul Maqdis. Tusaqit alayki rutaban janiyya. Allah speaks about the direction of Baytul Maqdis. Makanan sharqiyya. Allah speaks about the mihrabs. Now in the Quran, Allah mentions mihrab four times. And all of these four mihrabs were inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. And Allah mentions all of them in the Quran. Number one, Kullama dakhala alayha zakariya al-mihrab. Number two, Fanadathu al-malaikata wa huwa qa'imun yusalli fi al-mihrab. Number three, Hal ataka naba'u al-khasm ith tasawwaru al-mihrab. And number four, Fakharaja alayha, Fakharaja ala qawmihi min al-mihrabi. An fa'awha ilayhim an sabbihu bukratan. Wa'ashiyya. Allah speaks about the insect of Baytul Maqdis. Ya ayyuhan namla. ادخلوا مساكنكم لا يحطمنكم سليمان وجنوده جنوده وهم لا يشع سورة النمل a whole سورة and where did this incident happen in Baytul Maqdis in Palestine Allah speaks about the fruits of Baytul Maqdis والتين والزيتون Allah speaks about the level of the land of Baytul Maqdis في أدنى الأرض Allah speaks about the iron of Baytul Maqdis وألنا له الحديد Allah speaks about the armor of Baytul Maqdis وعلمناه صنعة لبوس Allah speaks about the birds of Baytul Maqdis يا جبال أوبي معه والطير والطير محشورة إسا عليه السلام فيكون طيرا بإذن الله Allah speaks about the specific bird of Baytul Maqdis Allah speaks about the donkey of Baytul Maqdis Uzair alayhi salam manzur ila himarik each thing Allah speaks about the water of Baytul Maqdis Ayyub alayhi salam is ill Allah says to him urkud bi rijlik hadha mughtasalun baridun wa sharab the water of Baytul Maqdis the water of Palestine Allah speaks about the rivers of Palestine inna allaha mubtalikum bi nahar إن الله مبتليكم بنهار الله speaks about the land أدخلوا الأرض المقدسة التي كتب الله لكم الله speaks about the towns and the villages of بيت المقدس أو كالذي مر على قرية وهي خاوية على عروشها this is not an exhaustive list this is just to give you a glimpse that when next time you open the Quran look at what you're reading think about what you're reading understand that this is your land this belongs to you this is part of the quran nobody can take this away from you this belongs to you our connection to this land and to this masjid and to these people should be based on the quran and the sunnah of faith but this is something that it, the things can end you know my friend dr habib who's come with me he was asking me yesterday he asked me a very personal question he says you know you've been going for alhamdulillah we've been traveling there for the last 15 years he said you know if if things calm down Masjid al-Aqsa is liberated, right? Think, imagine Masjid al-Aqsa is liberated and everything's calmed down and there's peace there. Would you still carry on going there? Would you still carry on doing the work that you're doing? And I had to think about it because nobody's asked me that question before. And I said, of course we would. Of course we would. Because to ensure it remains liberated, we have to carry on frequenting it. We have to carry on speaking about it. At the moment, it's in occupation and we're not speaking about it. And this is why, the reason why we're in the state we are is because we have not connected to Masjid al-Aqsa, to Palestine, to Baytul Maqdis, a faith-based connection. So this is what's required. So this is, these are the verses that are being revealed. Now, Sahaba were not like you and me. You have, mashallah, Qari Sayyid Sahib reciting beautiful Quran. But even then, even then, if I ask you, what did he recite in Fajr? You will, I don't remember. When the Sahaba were reciting, were listening to the Quran, they were pondering upon its meaning. When they're le- hearing, these are all Makki ayat, by the way. All of these ayat are being revealed in Makkah al Mukarramah. And the surahs that are being revealed are all related to the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam and their stories, most of which took place in Baytul Maqdis. When you open the Quran, you have Surah Al Fatiha. Then Surah Al Baqarah. Then one of the largest surahs after that is Al Imran. Who are these people? Imran. An Imam of Masjid Al-Aqsa, his wife Hannah, Allah speaks about her in the Quran. And then through them, what do they have? Maryam. And then from there, the stories that are being revealed in the Quran, Dawud alayhi salam from Baytul Maqdis, Suleiman alayhi salam from Baytul Maqdis, Ayyub alayhi salam from Baytul Maqdis, Isa alayhi salam from Baytul Maqdis, Zakariya alayhi salam from Baytul Maqdis. You carry on naming Nabi after Nabi, Prophet after Prophet. All of these surahs in the Quran that are being revealed, which the Sahaba are receiving this revelation from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Can you see how strongly they are connected and attached to Masjid al-Aqsa? They're facing it in their salah, so that's a spiritual connection. And religiously, now through the Quranic text, they are being connected to Masjid al-Aqsa. Not only that, 
Quran is not just a book in which there are stories of the people of the past mentioned. One of the other features of the Quran is the Quran gives us certain prophecies, things that are going to happen in the future. Did you know the first prophecy the Quran gave was related to Baytul Maqdis directly? The first prophecy. What is that in the Quran? During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were two superpowers, the Roman and the Persian Empire. And without going into the detail, we know that the first prophecy in the Quran is in Surah Al-Rum. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim, Ghulibat Al-Rum, where? Where? Fi Adan Al-Ard. Do you know the Romans? They were totally annihilated by the Persian Empire. When Damascus fell, the Quran was silent. When Egypt fell, the Quran was silent. When parts of Turkey fell, Quran was silent. When parts of Syria fell, Quran was silent. But when the Persian army came to Jericho, Ariha, to Baytul Maqdis, and they destroyed the Roman army there, Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam with the verses of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alif lam mim. Ghulibat ar-Rum. Where? Fi adan al-Ard. And then Allah also gave this prophecy, and not one prophecy, I say there are three prophecies in this ayat of the Quran. وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِذْعِ سِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in regards to this, that that day is going to come, that in less than 10 years, in less than 10 years, the Roman army, the Roman empire, is going to overpower the Persian empire. In less than 10 years, prophecy 1. وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ Number two, anfi adn al ard. Number three, many ulama mention fi adn al ard could have many meanings. We don't have time to go into that. But now we know that the lowest level in the whole world, the lowest point on earth, is Jericho, almost 400 meters below sea level. Any of you who have been will know that it's the lowest level on earth. Allah is calling it fi adn al ard. Number two. And number three. وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ They are still in Makkah al Mukarramah. Allah is saying. This fulfillment of the prophecy that the Roman Empire, who have been totally shattered by the Persians, they're going to stand again victorious on their feet and they're going to defeat the Persian Empire in less than 10 years. And the day it happens, is going to be a day when the believers will be rejoicing with the, with the help of Allah. Now, would believers rejoice because the Romans have been uh, victorious? Does Allah's help come with the Romans? No. We learn later on that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba became victorious in the Battle of Badr, at the end of the Battle of Badr, that was the same time when they received the news that the Romans have overpowered the Persians. Beautiful ayat of the Quran, but what is to be mentioned is the first prophecy is in relation to Baytul Maqdis. So this is also something we find in the Quran. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam utilized certain political strategies. When Baytul Maqdis came back to the Romans, to the Byzantine Empire, the emperor at the time was Herakl, Heraclius. Where was his center? Where, where was, what is Byzantium? What's Byzantium? You know the Roman Empire split into two, the west and the east. So one became Byzantium. Where is Byzantium today? What's Byzantium? Turkey. Where, where exactly in Turkey? Istanbul. So Istanbul, which was Constantinople, before that Byzantium, this is where Herakl was based. To pay thanksgiving, we hear in the Sahih al-Bukhari, to pay thanksgiving, because Allah granted the Roman, Romans victory, he decided to come all the way to Jerusalem to pay his thanks, because that is a center of Christianity as well. Whilst he was there, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to send him a letter. He could have sent it there, but he decided to send it when he was here. Long story cut short, at the end of the whole incident that happens with Abu Sufyan and others, Herakl says, if this man becomes victorious, then he's going to own the land that I'm standing on today. The land that I'm standing on today is going to be his. And this is exactly what happened. Now, following this incident, we find in Medina Makkatul Mukarrama, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes through difficult periods, he loses his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha, his uncle passes away, you know what happened in Ta'if. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now invited for the most miraculous journey of his life. The Burak is bought. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he travels all the way from Masjidul Haram to Masjidul Aqsa. 
and all of the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam have gathered. I call this a flagship ceremony. This was no ordinary gathering. This is the great, you know, we've gathered like this. May Allah keep us gathered, keep us united. May Allah allow us to continue gathering for good causes. This was considered the greatest gathering ever to take place on the face of this earth. Never will this earth ever experience such a great noble gathering. Allah chose that to happen. Where? In Palestine, in Baytul Maqdis, in Al Masjid Al Aqsa Al Mubarak. And the Prophet ﷺ stands at the front, all of the other Anbiya stand behind. And this was a flagship ceremony. Every Nabi is now handing over the custodianship of this masjid and this land. That our time has now come to an end. This masjid and this land now belongs to you. And this was symbolic. It could have happened anywhere else. Allah made it happen there. The Anbiya ﷺ stand behind. The Prophet ﷺ leads them in the prayer. And remember, Al Masjid Al Aqsa is what? What did we say it is? What did we say it is? 144. Have you forgotten already? 144,000 square meters of land. Not a Masjid Al Aqsa is not a building. And the Dome of the Rock, the Dome of the Rock, now, do you know how the Kaaba is an integral part of Al Masjid Al Aqsa? Riyadhul Jannah is an integral part of Masjid Al Aqsa. The Dome of the Rock is the integral part of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Don't listen to what people tell you that it's a conspiracy. That they're just trying to... What is a conspiracy is what you've fallen in. You've fallen into the conspiracy without realizing. This is exactly what the Zionists want you to believe. That Musalla Qibli is Masjid Al-Aqsa, the rest of it is just open land. No, 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 no. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. When Allah says Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, He's referring to the whole of the area. Praying, there's about 1,200 trees inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. 600 of them are olive trees. If you were to pray underneath one of the trees in Masjid Al-Aqsa, you'll get the full reward of praying inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. You don't need to be in the building at the front to get the reward. That's a building. Yes, the Imam stands there. We need to have roofed areas because it's massive. You can fit almost half a million people inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. And what's really sad is in the last three weeks, in the last three weeks, without, because everybody's focused on one side, they are not allowing anyone to enter inside Masjid Al-Aqsa unless you live in the old city of Jerusalem and you're over the age of 70. And sometimes old men, old ladies over the age of 70 are coming and they are being turned away. On a normal Friday, more than 50,000 people pray inside Masjid Al-Aqsa, Jummah. And in Ramadan, you have 200, 300, sometimes 450,000 people. In the last three Jumas, they've only allowed 5,000 people, which is a very low number. The rest of the people are trying to pray on the streets, and they're being attacked, they're being uh, uh, imprisoned, they're being, uh, they're, they're, they're being shot at, they're being dispersed by various dispersal means that they have. Anyhow, so coming back. Now, the Prophet wasallam he goes for Mi'raj. When he returns from the Mi'raj journey, the Mushrikeen of Makkah are really excited. Because they think now we have a chance to go to someone who's as close to him, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and to convince him otherwise. They say, Abu Bakr, do you know what your friend is saying? What is he saying? He's saying that he went from Masjid al-Haram, from Makkah to Jerusalem, Ilya, it was known in that time, and back in one night. In one night he went and he came back. And the... Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu said, well, he tells us things beyond this as well. I believe those. So this is not difficult to believe. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, now, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was very well traveled. He would conduct many trade journeys. A hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari tell us and indicate to us that he even had houses in the places of Gaza as well. Kitab al-Istidhan, you will find some, some narrations telling you that he was asking regarding facing the Qibla whilst passing urine, should we face towards the Kaaba or Masjid Al-Aqsa or not? There are narrations in regard to that. So he was very well traveled. He would go to Gaza. He would go to Asham. He would go to these places regularly. So he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what did he say? He says, Ya Rasulullah, Fasifli Bayt Al-Maqdis, Fa inni qad atayituhum. Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, please describe Bayt Al-Maqdis to me. Because I've been there. I've been there, I want to hear it from you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started describing Masjid al-Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And each time he would describe something, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would say, Sadaqta, 
Ashhadu annaka Rasul Allah. You spoke the truth. I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give another description. He would say sadaqta. Ashhadu annaka Rasul Allah. I bear witness you are the messenger of Allah. He continued doing this, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on this occasion he says wa anta ya Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiyallahu anhu earned his title of as Siddiq through the barakah of Baitul Maqdis. We know him. Abu, we say Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Abu Bakr as Siddiq. What does he mean as Siddiq? Where did he earn this title? Wa anta ya Abu Bakr as Siddiq. From this incident, for confirming the reports of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding Masjid al Aqsa, Baitul Maqdis, one hadith, hadith of Sahih Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "I was in Al Hijr, meaning the Hatim area, the semicircle around the Kaaba. The Quraysh came to me. They started bombarding me with questions. Okay, if you've been there, describe it to us. Describe it to us." He says, "I couldn't remember all the details," and he says a sentence which I want to highlight over here. We know the difficulties he endured in Makkah al Mukarramah. We know the persecution in Taif. We know what happened in Ahzab when he was tying stones to his stomach. But these are his own words. I'm not saying this. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam describing that moment. He says, "Fakuribtu kurbatan ma kuribtu mithlahu qattu." He says, "I experienced such distress. I have never experienced distress like this ever before." Fakuribtu kurbatan. He says, "The distress I had at that time, standing there, being quizzed by the Quraysh, tell us regarding what you saw." He says, "I couldn't remember." How did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala console him? The first time when he went through the most tragic moments in his life, the passing away of Khadija, the dying of Abu Talib, and the persecution at the hands of the Taif mob. What did Allah do to cool him? Where did Allah take him? He took him and he showed him Al Masjid Al Aqsa. And now again, when he comes back and he feels so distressed in his own words, "Fakurib tu kurbatan." What did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala do? He says, "I was standing there. Allah exposed and opened to me." A vision of Baitul Maqdis. I was looking at it, and I was answering their questions. I could see it. This is how Allah cooled the eyes and the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, then the Hijrah happens. Migration. They come to Medina Munawwara. Medina Munawwara. Sixteen or seventeen months. They continue praying towards Masjid Al Aqsa, and then the Kaaba. The, the Qibla is changed towards the Kaaba. Now, the problem we have here, when they're in Medina Munawwara, they've got a new issue, and that is Makkah Al Mukarrama is under occupation now. Muslims don't have Makkah Al Mukarrama, so and from then until Al Hudaybiya, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam concentrated all his efforts towards Makkah Al Mukarrama. How can Muslims gain Makkah Al Mukarrama once again? Until they come to Hudaybiya, and when they are in Hudaybiya, and they are making the compromises, Sayyiduna Umar radhiyallahu anhu. He says, "Ya Rasool Allah, alasna ala al-haq wa hum ala al-baatil." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, despite that, he continues and he makes the compromise. He signs the agreement. He makes the treaty. When that happens, Muslims thought that they are losing. Like now, Muslims feel they are losing. But Allah subhanahu wa taala sends Jibril with the ayat of the Quran: "Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina." Oh Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Makkah is going to be yours. We are going to give you a conquest, and it's going to be a huge conquest. From that moment onwards, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew that Makkah al Mukarrama is now secured, is now secured because before that in Ahzab, when the battle of the trench was over, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, according to Sahih al Bukhari, made a very profound statement. What did he say? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said at that time, "Al an nahzuhum wa la yahzunana, nahnu nasiru ilayhim." He says, "From now onwards." They will not fight us. We will fight them. We will go towards them. From now onwards, the wa tilka al ayyamun da wiluha bain al nas. Things have changed. From he indicated from that time onwards, and now from Hudaybiyah, because now he knows Makkah al Mukarrama is secured. Allah has promised inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Now all of the efforts are towards Baitul Maqdis. Now you might ask me how. Let's look at life in Medina. Whilst we're coming towards the end, let's look at life in Medina. Whilst in Medina, did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba forget about Masjid al-Aqsa, Baitul Maqdis, 
or was it still fresh in the minds? Let me show you how it was still fresh in the minds. It was the common discussion. It was the effort and the, the concentration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We find an incident of Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhum. Shaddad ibn Aus, who's buried adjacent to the wall of Masjid al-Aqsa, those of you who visited will have visited the grave of Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhu. On one occasion, Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu ta'ala anhu is not feeling well. He was breathing very heavily. He's unwell. I feel very constricted. How, what should I do? The Prophet ﷺ to cheer him up, to make him feel better. In a situation when he was feeling down, he was feeling miserable like a lot of us are, seeing what's happening. How did the Prophet ﷺ cheer him up? Allah ubashiruka ya Shaddad. Shaddad, should I not give you some good news? He says, Bala ya Rasulullah. What did he say? In Shama yuftah. The Levant is going to be conquered. It's going to be liberated. وَبَيْتُ الْمَقْدِسِ يُفْتَحْ Baytul الْمَقْدِسِ is going to be conquered and liberated. وَتَكُونَ أَنْتَ وَوَلَدُكَ أَئِمَّةً فِيهِ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ And you, O Shaddad, you and your children are going to become the Imams of Masjid Al-Aqsa. This is how he uplifted the spirits of the Sahaba at a time where people were feeling down. And this is what happened. Eventually he goes, he travels. Him and his children become the Imams of Masjid Al-Aqsa. And this is now a living testimony of this hadith that you find the grave of Sayyiduna Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu ta'ala who is from Rawatul Hadith. You will find him buried adjacent to the wall of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Anybody visiting will definitely visit the grave of Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhu. This is not the only incident. There are many incidents. I share with you another one. There was a Sahabi by the name of Dhul Asabi radiallahu anhu. And for the Sahaba, you know, seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that was everything. Being with him, experiencing his company, they had so much love for him. Many a times they would come to retire to bed at night and they would remember him. They'd become restless. And then they would say to themselves, nothing to worry about. In the morning we'll see him in Fajr. Or we'll see him in Dhar. We'll see him in Asr. We'll see him in Maghrib. Dhul Asabi, a thought crossed his mind. What if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passes away before me? How am I going to survive? How am I going to live in Medina Munawwara? How, how am I going to visit the same masjid where he would be leading the salah and somebody else is there? I will not be able to bear this. So he comes and asks this question to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, in ibtulina bil baqai, famadha ta'muruna. In ibtulina bil baqai ba'daka famadha ta'aina ta'muruna, he says. O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If Allah decides to test us, by keeping us alive after your departure from this world. It's going to be a huge test. I won't be able to stay in Medina Munawwara. It's going to be very difficult. Very, very difficult for me to stay and not be able to see you, not be able to experience your gatherings. فَأَيْنَ تَأْمُرُنَا Where do you command me to go and stay? Tell me somewhere else where I should go. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? عَلَيْكَ بِبَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ Make sure you go and you take up residency in Baytul Maqdis. And then he said, I hope and I pray that maybe Allah will give pious offspring. And morning and evening regularly they will frequent Masjid Al-Aqsa. Morning and evening they will continue going. This is Dhul Asabi radiallahu anhum. Even within the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this was men, even women. Even women, they were talking about Masjid Al-Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis in Masjid Al-Nabawi. You know, there's a lady called Maymuna radiallahu anha. She would serve in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she has done a massive, massive, huge favor to us. On our behalf, she asked this question. She couldn't have asked anything. She said, Ya Rasulullah, aftina fi Baytul Maqdis. Ya Rasulullah, give us a fatwa. Regarding Baytul Maqdis, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Give us some detailed explanation. Do you know what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? He says, Ardul Manshari Wal Mahshar. Masjid Al-Aqsa is going to be the land of resurrection and gathering on the Day of Judgment. So whether you like it or not, you have to go there. Imam Al-Qurtubi, while speaking about Wastami' Yawma Yunadi Al-Munadi Min Makanin Qareeb. He writes under this ayah, he says that now, as we are speaking now, Israfil Alayhi Salam is standing with the Sur. On the rock of Baytul Maqdis, you know you see the dome of the rock? Under there there is a rock. He says, he writes under this ayah, that Israfil is standing there, because that is going to be the land of resurrection. If the Mu'addin is making adhan here, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ الدَّاعِ When the Mu'addin is making the adhan, people will come where the Mu'addin is. If that is Ardul Manshari wal Mahshar, he's saying that is where Israfil is standing. He's waiting for the command of Allah. Allah will say, blow. And who is the first person to arrive? Al-Hashir. 
صلى الله عليه وسلم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the first to arrive on that day to Baytul Maqdis and people will gather around him صلى الله عليه وسلم so now she says tell us about Baytul Maqdis the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said أرض المنشر والمحشر he didn't stop there he said إيتوه فصلوا فيه go there and try and pray salah there because one salah there is equal to a thousand salah elsewhere now Maymuna radiallahu anha was a simple woman. She's a helper in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She didn't have a means of conveyance. She didn't have any money. And in one of some of the riwayat of Abu Dawood, it says, فَكَانَتْ ذَاكَ uh, In those days, there was harb. There was a war taking place. Like now, as we see, there was harb. So we can relate to this. So she said, what if somebody can't go there for X, Y, and Z reasons? And you can have any reason. We can't go there right now. What should we do? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَلْيُهْدِ إِلَيْهِ زَيْتًا يُسْرَجُ فِيهِ أو فِي قَنَادِيلِهِ You should gift a gift of oil which will be used to light the lanterns of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Normally we stop here on the hadith. I'm going to carry on because the last part of the hadith is of relevance. And I think Maymuna radiallahu anha has done us a great favor. Because the last part of the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَإِنَّ مَنْ أَهْدَى لَهُ and one narration says, Shay'an, not oil, Shay'an, anything, Kana kaman salla fihi. Whoever dedicates or gifts anything to the cause of Masjid al Aqsa, you get the reward of praying inside Masjid al Aqsa. If you make this intention today, you're sitting here, you've got together for this Khatmul Bukhari to listen to this talk, to serve the cause of Masjid al Aqsa. According to this hadith, I'm not saying it. فَإِنَّ مَنْ أَهْدَى لَهُ كَانَ كَمَنْ صَلَّى فِيهِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, whoever dedicates anything for the cause of Masjid al-Aqsa, it's as if you have prayed in Masjid al-Aqsa. So whether you're signing a petition, whether you're taking part in a protest, whether you're coming to Khatm al-Bukhari, whether you're waking up for tahajjud in the night, whether you're attending these events, whether you're responding to the lies and the fabrication on social media, regardless of what you're doing, within your capacity, whatever you're doing, if you make this intention that you're doing it to serve the cause of Masjid al-Aqsa, Bayt al Maqdis in Palestine, inshallah, according to this hadith, you will get the reward of praying inside Masjid al-Aqsa. So, again, it doesn't stop here. In Masjid Nabawi, in Masjid Nabawi, Imam Hakim mentioned this in Mustadrak. In Masjid Nabawi, Abu Dhar radiallahu says, Sahaba are sitting. And we're having this conversation. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is also sitting. And he's overhearing our conversation. Do you know what the discussion is? The discussion is this. Is it more virtuous to pray in Masjid Nabawi? Or is it more virtuous to pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa? Can you imagine? Sahaba are talking about this inside Masjid Nabi. They didn't forget about Masjid Al-Aqsa just because the Qibla had changed. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam overheard the conversation and he took part in the conversation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was Salatun fi Masjid Hada. He gave an explanation. One salah in my masjid is equal to praying four salah in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now, had the hadith stopped here, people would think, okay. What's the point of going to Masjid Al-Aqsa? Let's just go to Masjid Nabawi and get four times the reward, right? But does the hadith stop here? It doesn't. After this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَلَا نِعْمَ الْمُصَلَّهُ وَلَا نِعْمَ الْمُصَلَّهُ What an amazing and excellent place to perform salah Masjid Al-Aqsa is. That's profound. But he didn't stop there. Then he continued. And he said, وَلَا يُوشِكَنَّ أن يكون للرجل مثل شطاني فرسه من الأرض حيث يرى منه بيت المقدس خير له من الدنيا جميعا. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that time is very close. It's coming that a person will own land equivalent to the rope of their horse. From where you'll be able to just see Masjid al-Aqsa Bayt al-Maqdis. This one glance will be better than the whole world and what it contains. If just looking at Masjid al-Aqsa. Is so special. Imagine praying there. Imagine protecting it. Imagine serving the cause of Masjid al-Aqsa. And some people lived for this cause. The birth of Maryam. Look at Maryam alayhi salam. Some ulama say Maryam actually means Khadima to Baytir Rabb. This is the whole purpose of her existence. Her existence, they had a child. They said, we're going to dedicate this child for Baytul Maqdis. Look how Allah blessed them. Allah blessed them with something unimaginable. To have a child without a father, Isa alayhi salam. And this child was extraordinary. Many miracles. Allah took him to the heavens and he will come back again in that very same place. 
And not only him, look at Yahya alayhi salam, Zakari alayhi salam. You think he was just an old man who wanted kids in old age? Was that the only reason? No, he didn't want to just fulfill his desire. If you understand the story, what's going on? The society of Baytul Maqdis had become corrupt. The family members were not people who were worthy of upholding the rights of Masjid Al-Aqsa and looking after it. He was worried, if I leave the world, what is going to happen to Masjid Al-Aqsa? This is why we have Kaf, Haya, Ain, Saad. He's making the dua. And what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him Yahya alayhi salam. According to Hadith of Sunan al Nasai, we find Yahya alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam, he was the khatib of Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he would lecture inside Masjid Al-Aqsa. And the Hadith mentions that the Masjid would be brimming full. People would be on the, on the roofs and the balconies. And they would come to listen to the advices of Sayyiduna Yahya alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam's whole existence was for the preservation of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Like so was the existence of Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi salam and then following Sayyidatuna Isa alayhi salam as well. So anyhow, we continue with this. Coming towards the end now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. Now he does something very interesting. And that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now actively, he starts taking steps towards Baytul Maqdis. You've got Medina Munawwara here. In the northwest is Baytul Maqdis, Masjid Al-Aqsa, Asham, the Levant. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now starts sending armies, troops in that direction. If you study the last part of the seerah, you will find he focused all his attention towards that particular land. We know he had a strategy in mind. This is what he, he lived with in the last part of his life. And he passed away on this. We'll be coming to this in a moment. And even after he passed away, we see how the Sahaba continued his journey. So, in conclusion, the Prophet ﷺ prepares an army and he sends them to a place called Muta. Again, this is where is it going? In the direction of Baytul Maqdis. And we find how in Muta, many Sahaba took part. We find how certain Sahaba, senior Sahaba, passed away. And this was a significant event. Following this, the Prophet ﷺ himself prepared one of the largest armies he has ever have he ever has and where were they going he didn't even hide the location normally he would say we're going that way and they would go that way because in harb and in war you're allowed to do this but this time it was very clear where's the direction where we're going tabuk the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has never traveled that far in a military expedition the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heads towards tabuk so many sahaba Imam al-Waqidi and others, they write, whilst he is traveling, wherever the Sahaba stop, he builds, he tells them to build a masjid and a well. They travel again, masjid and a well. Travel again, masjid and a well. What is he doing? He's preparing the path of liberation. He's preparing the path of the conquest. He knows that these lands are under occupation. They are under other forces. And this is the effort of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't forget. It started from wara'at ummi nura. His mother saw that light shining and he worked tirelessly throughout his life. And towards the latter part of his life, his efforts increased towards this cause. So he has Tabuk. So now a whole journey of Tabuk. Nobody knew why all this was happening. Why is he asking the Sahaba to prepare this well and a place of Salah? And then when he gets to Tabuk, he does something else. There are surrounding communities in Tabuk by the coastal areas there's a place called Makna. Makna was full of Jews. The Prophet ﷺ went to the people of Makna and he gave them aman. He gave them aman. He appointed a certain amount of jizya and he had a discussion with them. And he made an agreement. If my army was to ever come from here, will you supply them with weapons? From Medina Munawwara they will be coming. It's a long distance. How are they going to carry their weapons with them? Can we make an agreement? That the people of Makna, who were Jews at the time, we make this agreement that you will supply them weapons. They agreed. Then he went to Ayla, Ayla, Eliat, the port, and he made an agreement with them. If my people come from here, will you allow them passage into the Negev Desert? Because that is the entrance point. And they gave the Aman, and they gave the agreement. And then he went to a place called Adru, or Adriyat, and there he made an agreement, will you supply my people clothing? So food and weapons from Makna, Passage from Ayla and from the people of Adru, clothing and protection. And will you join their armies? And they all gave this agreement. Now we come to the conclusion of Tabuk. And we come to the hadith of Awf ibn Malik al-Ashja'i radiyallahu anhu in Sahih al-Bukhari. 
Awf ibn Malik al-Ashja'i radiyallahu says that on the day of Tabuk, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in a leather tent. It was very small. So I came to the tent and I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam permission, can I enter? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said yes. Now he says humorously because the tent was so small, I said shall I enter partially or fully? How, how, can I, how can I come in? It's so small. Should I just put a leg in? Just put my head in? Or do you want me to come in fully? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, no, 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 enter fully. He says, I entered into the tent. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa became very serious. He sat up in his place. And he said, Auf, u'udud sitan bayna yadayi sa'a. Count six things that are going to happen between now and the final hour. The first thing he said, mawti, I'm going to pass away. And immediately the second thing he said, ثُمَّ فَتْحُ بَيْتِ maqdis The next thing that's going to happen is going to be the fath and the conquest of Baytul Maqdis. It's almost as if the Prophet ﷺ gives the explanation of this whole Tabuk journey right at the end now. Why he was making this journey, why he made these agreements. And now he has for the first time made it very, very clear. That very soon after my demise, one of the first things that's going to happen is there's going to be an effort towards the fath and the conquest of Baytul Maqdis. Now we come to the final moments of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu. Where did we start from? Waraat ummi nura, adaat minha qusur sham. We are now on the deathbed. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is lying there. He sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is his final moments. And Azad Qari Sayyid Sab mentioned. That what were the final things in his khutbah he mentioned? What were the final things that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said? What were his final words, advices? If you were listening carefully to Qarisab, you would have heard it. What did he say? As salah, as salah. Be very mindful regarding the performance of your salah. Number two. Look after your subordinates. That could be your slaves. That could be your family members. That could be the women. This is general advice. And normally we stop here. Why? Bobby Klager. We don't say the third one. Even Karisab didn't say the third one as well. We all stop here. There was another third thing the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, which is related to what we're speaking about. Because it completes the journey. This was the planning of the Prophet ﷺ. We normally attribute the victory and the conquest to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. But the strategist was the Prophet ﷺ himself. From day one, we could say, Allah, وَرَأَتْ أُمِّي نُورًا أَضَاءَتْ مِنْ حَقُّ sham. This is continuing. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As-salah, as-salah, wa ma malakat aymanukum. What's number three? Please assist me, ulama. What did he say? You guys have silenced the ulama as well. What is it? What did he say? Anyone? Hmm? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? In his final moments, As-salah, as-salah, then you guys are really scared yes in his final moments yep this is the, that's that's the, I'm talking about the advices the advices yes what did he say he said, no matter what happens, you must dispatch the army of Usama bin Zayd. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned from Hajjatul Bada, he started preparing a special army. Now you know why you guys were scared. He started preparing this army of Usama bin Zayd radiallahu. His father was killed. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him very clear instructions. Sir, bi ismillah, go in the name of Allah. Don't stop until you reach the place where your father was killed. So he was being sent in a very similar direction towards Baytul Maqdis. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became unconscious. When he gained consciousness, we spoke about the salah. But he also asked, has the army gone? And they said, no, send it. Dispatch the army. Why is it still here? And he falls unconscious. He gains consciousness again. And he asks regarding the army of Usama bin Zaid. Why is it still here? Send it. And eventually the army leaves. When the army of Usama bin Zaid reaches the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, they hear regarding the sad news of the demise of the Prophet ﷺ. So they stop. The people now who is in charge, without a doubt, without any ikhtilaf, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu becomes Amirul Mu'minin. 
And the people come to him and say, Ya Rasulullah, uh, O Amirul Mu'mineen, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's janazah is here. How can we send the army now? Let's call them back. Let's take it easy. What did he say? Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu said, on this occasion, sometimes we misinterpret this and put this line elsewhere. He says, on this occasion, regarding sending this army out, he says, the dogs and the beasts of Medina can bite on my body, but I will not change from the pathway of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to send this army, and I'm going to continue with sending it. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَانَ عَوَّلَ أَنْ يَصْرِفَ هِمَّتَهُ إِلَى الشَّامِ This is what he said. Know very well that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم focused and concentrated all his efforts in the last part of his life towards الشَّامِ the area surrounding Baytul Maqdis فَقَبَدَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Allah decided to take him away. أَلَا وَإِنِّي عَازِمٌ he says, I am resolute. Listen very carefully, he says to the people. I am re- You're telling me not to send this army? He says, Allah wa inni azimun. Allah an uanni an uwajjiha abtal al muslimin ila sham. Bi ahlihim wa malihim. I'm going to concentrate and focus all of the Muslim armies and send them towards the Levant and ash sham. Why? Fa inna rasul Allahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ambaani bi dhalika qabla mawtih. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me to do this. Before he passed away. So much so that he wrote a letter to Khalid ibn al-Walid. Khalid ibn al-Walid is in Iraq. He writes a letter to him. He says, as soon as you receive this letter, bring your armies and join your armies to the Muslims that are in Asham, In Al-Baytul Maqdis and surrounding areas. Why? Because the conquest of one Qura min Qura Baytul Maqdis. La Qariyatun min Qura Baytul Maqdis. He says, the Fath and the conquest of one small area of Baytul Maqdis is more beloved to me than a whole Ristaqin Azim min Rasatiq al Iraq. A whole region of Iraq being conquered, that's not a big thing. But a small area of Baytul Maqdis being conquered, that means the world to me. Why? Who told me about this? Who made my tarbiyah? Who taught me about this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the army leaves. And let's do fast forward now, comes the time of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. The armies have been working tirelessly. Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala and other sahaba, they have laid the siege. And eventually, they agree to hand over the keys of Jerusalem to who? Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. When Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arrives, and he comes to Masjid al-Aqsa, they clean the masjid first. They clean the masjid. And then it comes for the time of salah. Hana waktu salah. When the time of salah comes, what do we need? Adhan. Who's going to call the adhan? When he came to Makkah to Al-Mukarramah, Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu climbed on the Kaaba and he called out the adhan. When he came to Masjid Nabawi, who called the adhan? Sayyidina Bilal ibn Rabah. So immediately, Amir al Mu'minin, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he called out, Aina Bilal ibn Rabah. Where is Bilal? He says, Ha'ana ya Amir al Mu'minin, I'm here. I'm here. What shall I do? He says to him, Adhin, call the adhan. So Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala, what does he say? He says, أَقْصَمْتُ أَلَّا أُؤَذِّنَ لِأَحَدٍ بَعْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ He says, I have made a vow. I will never call the adhan for anybody after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amir al-Mu'minin Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu says, أَذِّن! Call the adhan. He had to. Because he called it in Mecca. He called it in Medina. And al-Masjid al-Aqsa is part of this, this circle. So he says, أَقْصَمْتُ أَلَّا أُؤَذِّنَ لِأَحَدٍ بَعْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Amir al-Mu'minin said to him, Adhin ya Bilal, you must call the adhan. He says, Ata'muruni ya Amir al-Mu'minin, are you commanding me? Is this a command? Or are you just requesting me? He says, no, it's a command. He says, if it's a command, I don't have a choice. Sayyiduna Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu ta'ala anhu begins calling the adhan inside Masjid al-Aqsa. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Silence. Everybody's listening. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Silence. When he came to Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah, that's it. The Sahaba broke into tears. They say we have not seen men cry the way the men cried in Masjid Al Aqsa upon hearing the Adhan of Bilal ibn Rabah. Two notable individuals, Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Abu Ubaida ibn Al Jarrah. The way they cried, the way they wept for a long period of time, they weren't just crying. They were remembering the memories of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they realized they knew how happy he sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be on this day of Fath, because tirelessly he was working. You know what we mentioned? Waraat ummi nura 
adaat minha qusur asham sahaba visually saw the materialization of this they saw the nur of nubuwa and they felt as if rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with them on that day celebrating the conquest of masjid al aqsa this is the your story this is your lesson this is your journey this is your connection masjid al aqsa is an ayah of the quran masjid al aqsa is your aqeedah palestine is your belief it's your aqeedah it's not just a land it's not just about politics it's not just about bombs it's not just about killing it's not just about the zionist occupation yes temporarily that's there and i end by saying palestine will be free are you not excited about it palestine will be free say inshallah say it with me palestine will be free masjid al aqsa will be liberated say masjid al aqsa will be liberated the question is what role will you play that's the question the question is what role will you play we have many duties towards masjid al aqsa and inshallah mufti yusuf sahab will be speaking about that in more detail may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin